Um, Your Highness, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session on democracy. My name is Adam Tooze and I will have the honour, the real, of moderating this extraordinary um, panel for us this afternoon. Um, the title of, of the session is Democracy, the Way Forward. Uh, it doesn't have a question mark, but I think there's a sort of slight sense of unease about the title. Uh, you could put this in historical terms. Is this a, a challenge to face the particular moment that we're in right now? You could think back over the history of the WEF over the half century that we've been meeting in a place like this and think about the vicissitudes of democracy worldwide from the era of the 1970s of military coups, of authoritarian regimes of both the left and the right. You could think to the moments of triumph in 89, but also of terror in 89 in China. You could think to the moments of kind of unipolar celebration, moments of insecurity and uncertainty. And we are, as we speak, in the middle of a great clash in Ukraine uh, in which the issues of democracy are engaged. But I think you could also put this question another way, which is to say that for democracy, it's sort of iteratively essential. It's iteratively essential to ask this question of where we go next, because democracy is best understood not as a fixed set of principles, a set of structures, but really a challenge to collectively and through deliberative and electoral <coughs> processes decide where we go next. So in that sense, you could remove the question mark and just say it's ordinary biz democratic business as usual. It's time to talk about what we're going to do next as usual. And I simply couldn't have asked for a more diverse uh, and more extraordinary panel of people to be, to be uh, chairing today to do this. Not one, but two presidents. Rodrigo Chavez Robles, the president of Costa Rica, next to me here. Eglis Levitz, the president of Latvia, uh, next to, to him. Tobias Bilstrom, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden. Alexandra Matvichuk, who is chair of the Civil Liberties Union of the Ukraine. Uh, Lord Mark, Mark Malach Brown, President of the Open Society Foundation, and Samantha Power, who is the Administrator of the US Agency for International Development. So an extraordinary range of expertise and experience that we have in the room. In light, I think, of the essential importance of the struggle in Ukraine for the question that we're talking about, you'll forgive me, and I hope the panelists will forgive me too, for completely overturning, if you like, the honorific uh, 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 ranking of status here and turning to Alexandra uh, to put the first question about the struggle that is going on in Ukraine. You observe this from uh, both a bird's eye view but also on the ground in your efforts to document war crimes. Um, maybe looking forward because the dimension and the focus of this <coughs> of our panel today is forward directed. Can you give us a sense of how you imagine a post-war democratic recovery and reconstruction going on in the Ukraine. Russia started this war not in February 2022, but in February 2014, when Ukraine obtained a chance for a quick democratic transformation after collapse of authoritarian regime due to revolution of dignity. And all three months of revolution of dignity, we as Ukrainian people are fighting for our democratic choice just for a chance to build a country where the rights of everybody are protected, government is independent and accountable, judiciary provides justice, and police do not beat student demonstrations. And in order to stop us on this way, Russia started this war because Putin is not afraid of NATO. Putin is afraid of the idea of freedom. And in this census, this is not just a war between two states. This is a war between two systems, authoritarianism and democracy. And that's why victory for Ukraine. It's not just to restore international order and push Russian troops out from the country, the occupied Crimea and other territories of Ukraine. Victory for Ukraine is succeed in democratic transformation and build a sustainable democratic institution. And success of Ukraine will have a huge impact to a democratic future of Russia itself and to other countries in our regions where this freedom is shrinked to the space of a prison cell. So in this regard, we as Ukrainians 
ask for support of international community to make Ukraine win fast. Thanks. You. Thank you. And that is a message that has echoed out across war making for 100 years now. I mean, this is an appeal, an appeal to link together the project of struggle and political reform and the establishment of democracy with an extraordinary resonance in European and world history. Um, President Levitz, I mean, your country is, in its modern form, was the creation of the first war in which that, that project was announced, World War I, and then its modern form, the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the war. You yourself, you were telling us in the Green Room ahead of time about your engagement in uh, international meetings on new democracies in the 1990s. You have over 30 years of experience in the field, if you like, of securing, stabilizing democracy. What are the sorts of lessons that stand out for you when we think about the future, the sorts of things that we should be focused on in thinking about, from your vantage point in the Baltic, uh, the cockpit, really, of, yeah. of history? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, from a historical uh, point of view, uh, democracy is a, a relatively modern democracy, new state order. It's uh, only established in the 20th century, the first wave after the First World War, the second wave after the Second World War, and the third wave after uh, the collapse of Soviet uh, Empire. So, but in between, there was also uh, uh, difficult times for democracy. And now, 30 years after the third wave of democracy, we see that now there are also turbulent times for democracy. Democracy is challenged both from, the, from uh, internal threats and external threats. External threats is also, as you, you rightly said, uh, uh, some uh, aggressive author authoritarian regimes uh, are not only for so to say, economic and other reasons, but also for ideological reasons uh, trying to undermine democracies, like here, uh, Russia's war against Ukraine. But we can see also that uh, in, in, in East Asia, there are also competition between um, authoritarian regime and uh, democratic regimes. Uh, in, in, uh, so um, these this are external threats. And we should uh, be very strong uh, to defense our countries, democratic countries, NATO is uh, the world's strongest military alliance of democratic <coughs> states. I want uh, to stress that, of democratic states. So internal threats, it's uh, much more complicated. Uh, internal threats are uh, in difference uh, to the internal threats uh, between uh, the two world wars uh, when there was a authoritarian uh, ideologies, which a certain attractivity uh, with strong leader and, and so on and so on. Uh, now I see the main uh, internal threat from populism. Populism is uh, not advocating uh, obligatory a very strong leader uh, as authoritarian leader, but uh, is attacking uh, the representative democracy. Representative democracy is relatively slow, slow state order, but uh, it is, uh, I would say, in complex world, in a complex society, is the only possible way to, to uh, come to uh, reasonable solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, there is uh, uh, artificial a contradiction which is uh, put forward by uh, populists between direct democracy yeah. on, and uh, representative democracy. And I think what we can do, so in Latvia, uh, there are no uh, other uh, anti-democratic uh, movements or organizations and so on, because we know very uh, very much uh, the value of democracy, this experience of Soviet colonialism, Soviet uh, imperialism, it, it is still there. Yes. And uh, we draw the conclusions. And therefore, Latvia is one of the sta more stable democracies, yes. I think, in these terms. But uh, in, in countries where such experience, negative experience, uh, is not there, uh, then, of course, uh, we should draw the attention on populism and try to convince uh, the population to trust the representative democracy. And uh, the core issue is a trust, trust or mistrust to the uh, uh, legitimate 
um, or, uh, legitimate institutions of democracy. I think this is a core issue, and then we can ask how to build the trust, how to increase the trust. But trust is a core issue. Thank you for laying it out like that. Staying in the region for just one more, one more phase of this. Prime Minister Billstrom, I mean, your country uh, has made a, a momentous decision, or is a making in the process of making a momentous decision precisely with regard to its external security arrangements. It's also a country which has seen dramatic change in the composition of its party spectrum. How do you see the war in its current form? Um, how, what kind of a challenge do you think it represents for the European project of democracy and for your country in particular? Well, thank you very much. Yes, Russia's unprovoked, uh, illegal and unjustified aggression on Ukraine is a huge challenge to not only this continent but to the entire world. Uh, and it shows, I think, that democracy is vital for peace and for human security. Um, I would also like to underline that it is a fact that, you know, we know very, very well that two democracies don't make war against another called the democratic peace axiom, I think it's, it's called in academic studies. And I think from this follows that a more democratic Russia would not have broken the peace in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so to answer your question, Europe's democratic project is therefore a vital part of our security policy and is viewed as such by, by the Swedish government, definitely. Um, we also have to understand that this aggression by Russia the overturning of the security order of, 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 of Europe, uh, well, that also follows that Russia will become more authoritarian, along with other states like Belarus. And that means that we have to step up, we have to invest more in human rights defenders and civil organizations, and we have to increase uh, uh, the efforts to make freedom come true in parts of Europe where freedom is still not, not existing or enjoyed by civil or, or political uh, rights. And finally, Alexandra, uh, since you are here, I would like to turn to you specific, specifically and say that, you know, uh, not only on behalf of Sweden, but also of the presidency of the European Union, we will be with you to the end. There is no alternative to you winning this war. And we have to step up our efforts in order to see to it that you win the war on the battlefield, but also that you win the peace once the war is over, that you can make a rebuilding of your society. And this is something which I, feel very strongly about having been to Kiev just a few, uh, just a month ago, together with all the Nordic Baltic ministers of foreign affairs, we traveled to Kiev and met President Zelensky and his cabinet. And I'm so astonished by the fighting spirit of your people and the efforts that you are doing. We will be there for you to the end. President <laughs> Rogers, if I may turn to you. you, you have a connection to the Ukraine uh, you, you work there in your World Bank days. You um, uh, also are, are to the fore amongst uh, your Latin American peers in um, having addressed the war and its legality. You also, um, along with the United States, co-chairing and co-hosting the Summit of Democracies. You're in a privileged vantage point from your point of view in the, from the, in the Western Hemisphere in really giving us a perspective on how you see this drama unfolding and its implications for the democratic project worldwide? Well, I, I come from a very different country. Uh, we were the first country in the world, I believe, to abolish its own military. Yes. Make it, we made it forbidden by constitution. And we adopted the rule of law. We adopted democracy long time ago. As a matter of fact, uh, in the 200 years since we got independence, we have had tiny little periods where democracy was, say, interrupted. Six weeks in 1948 with a revolution, a period in the 1850s that uh, had a very small dictatorship. Uh, personally, I do have that connection because I work in Ukraine. I live on Krishatik Street, uh, mm. right there in front of the market. I saw <coughs> the struggles uh, in the early 2000s of the Ukrainians trying to rebuild their economy when it was uh, melting during the crisis. And uh, in that sense, and having worked in the former Soviet Union, uh, when I became president, I used the words that the uh, foreign minister of Sweden just used, the criminal illegal attack of Russia to Ukraine. And I was taken to court in my own country being the president because I was violating Costa Rican's, Costa Rican's 
neutrality. The court said, no, the president can't say what the Costa Rican people think and what he thinks. We are not sending an army because we don't have one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, uh, you know, democracy has its quirks too. It was the right of the person who, or the, of the people who took me to court. And at the same time, we, were, we had a cyber attack associated to Russia. So you see the president speaking, is causing all these things. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as Churchill said, is the best democracy is the worst form of government <coughs> except all others. That's the one we have, is the least imperfect, but it requires courage. It requires saying what we believe. It requires taking a stance. It's true that a government subject to the political marketplace is less likely to take violent action against others. There are negative externalities to the world of not having democracies around. Case in point, Ukraine. So it's in our common interest that that democracy is enjoyed by all men and women in the world. And I think that uh, we have our challenges even in Latin America, whereby the challenge is not electing democratically a government. The challenge is that democracy to be sustained has to be profitable to the people. The quality of services, dealing with the crises that we see of immigration. Look at my poor country, 5.2 million. We have the largest number of requests for asylum, in the, the third largest in the world, in absolute terms. After Canada, United, well, after United States, Canada, we follow. Hmm. We have more than 20% of where people are economic immigrants or political refugees. So I think democracy con will continue. In my imagination, I cannot imagine a better way of electing governments. But we also need to be more courageous, be more accountable, and be able to deliver what most people want, share prosperity, peace, and a better future for our children. And in that is where democracies are struggling today to achieve that. And certainly, we, it would be in our interest that most countries in the world are democratic. Administrative power, can I turn to you of, the, of this extraordinary panel up here? You have perhaps the most capaciously global perspective in your position in uh, US uh, uh, development policy. Do you see a kind of roadmap, a, a vision for the democratic project in the 21st century, a, 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 a distinct, clear future outline? Or is it more a question of working at the nuts and bolts, as President Robles has laid out for us, delivering the basics and moral courage, some sort of combination of you know, bread plus, plus ethics, bread plus morality? Um, well, first, I, I think there is a path. It's a bit of both, I think, the tactical and then having the lodestar uh, that the President of Costa Rica just spoke to. Um, but I think even the language of democratic decline, uh, which is ubiquitous, 16, 17 years of democracy in decline, I think is uh, misleading. Democracy is under attack. It's under attack, as Alexandra said, and as we all know from without, from authoritarians, and increasingly within even established democracies, it's under attack from, from within. And so it's not a kind of force of gravity or natural trends, it is individuals that are making choices um, to support undemocratic and repressive elements or uh, to outright use uh, brutal military force. I think what, what we've tried to do at USAID is kind of step back and say, okay, just because we've promoted democracy in certain ways for all these years, given that we're, we have this moment <laughs> that's been a protracted one, uh, let's step back and say, what do we need to do differently? What do, what do the new coalitions need to look like? What does the toolkit need to look like? And I'll just give a couple examples of what I think needs to be part of this toolkit in that roadmap. One, one of the weapons of the autocratic and authoritarian and the oligarch uh, is the lawsuit. You know, it isn't just arrests 
and violence uh, of the kind that we've seen for generations. It's let's put a civil society organization out of business. Let's put a small newspaper out of business or an, a social media uh, a person who holds uh, someone accountable. And so we've created something, uh, launched something called Reporter's Shield, which is a fund to ensure, uh, to provide insurance to those reporters and those civil society organizations that just can't afford to insure themselves. The, the structural advantage that a state has, that an oligarch has, is unsurmountable for so many of these actors. That's one example of like a new tool. It's what, what is the weapon of choice? Okay, let's think about what is the, the way to combat that. Second, I think we've, in the past, and finally, I should say, we have used um, democracy assistance to support election monitors, to support independent media civil society as well we should. We focused less in thinking about promoting democracy on surging support that pays economic dividends when there is a reform opening. So that is the approach we are trying to see. When you see uh, the president of Zambia, who was arrested, I think, something like 15 times uh, and was barely allowed to campaign uh, against the prior administration uh, last month, <coughs> getting rid of criminal defamation of the president for the first time. When you see the president of Moldova fighting corruption and pushing for judicial reform, when you see President Lasso in Ecuador, who I believe is here, trying to integrate 500,000 Venezuelan migrants in the way that he has done, but with elements that you know, again, want to set back democratic progress, what are the things we can do in the economic space to support those political reform openings? And so uh, I just give uh, one example there. I, mean, I think public-private partnerships, given our audience, have to be at the heart of this. When there are bright spots, please, businesses, take note. Just spend that extra time getting to know whether there's an investment opportunity uh, in countries that are doing hard things, that are fighting for more transparency, uh, fighting those anti-democratic forces. We are announcing today, actually, more support for something called the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation that was developed in conjunction with the World Economic Forum. And that's basically private sector actors coming forward and saying, business is really hard to do in this country for these reasons. USAID, other development actors, governments, can you make it easier? Can you get a, rid of the sludge? Can you get rid of the paperwork? Uh, we are going to surge support to Ecuador, Tanzania, countries like that, that again are doing those hard things to try to facilitate trade and not merely, again, the, the classic tool, toolkit for democracy promotion. Fascinating. Um, I was going to turn to you, Lord Malach Brown, and ask a question that headed in a slightly opposite direction, because I take the point of uh, administrative powers intervention to say we need to be tactical. We need to respond to circumstance. We need to respond to the moves of our enemies. We need to respond to emergency. The question I was going to ask you was about institutions, about the long-term structure within which democracy functions. They clearly are pivotal to success. Can they also become fetter? How do we, how do we, how do we think about the role of institutions? Well, Adam, thanks. And I think, you know, I would hate to lose in Sam's very powerful response, a uh, core point that, you know, it's not so much that democracy is failing, it's that its attackers are attacking it. And I think, you know, it is behoves all of us at Davos, not this panel, which is very enthusiastic for democracy, but the sort of world-weary delegates or world-weary de delegates about democracy out there to bear in mind that the most enthusiastic voices for democracy this week in Davos are the Ukrainian voices. Why? Because there's a country attacking their democracy. And you know, we shouldn't all need that external threat to share Ukrainians' enthusiasm for a democratic future for all of us. And I think you know, that's the right starting point. And at Open Society, we spend an awful lot of money every year trying to support democracy and its institutions. I mean, just, I, I hope, Adam, with, without straying from your question, I mean, you know, there are a couple of lessons which I'm not sure whether they're scientific or not, but, um, you know, which I've seen watching our portfolio at work all over the world, um, is one, given the global demographics of an increasingly young population in many parts of the world, social movements are a better investment than political parties. Social movements are the funnel by which pe younger people come into politics. And I, whether I'm talking about 
the state of Georgia in the US or you know, Latin America or Africa. You know, I see that in, in, in much of our work. Secondly, election bodies and monitors is often not a very well placed investment. Um, you know, disinformation and trying to contain that seems to have a much greater outcome uh, in terms of whether the, real, the, the, the ones who really won get to claim that victory or, or not. Um, the, the, the third, and this is an obvious one, is the idea of democracy is much less powerful uh, than the delivery of democracy. Uh, you know, people are quite pragmatic nowadays. They're not terribly interested in many countries in being engaged in a civic debate about its, its values so much as is it delivering for us. And a fourth one is a sort of stability versus change point. I spent a decade of my life as a political consultant all over the world. And, you know, some years into it, uh, with one of my colleagues was drinking Pisco Sours in Lima, Peru, a country whose own democracy is now under challenge. And he said, you know, we've spent a lot of money around the world on polling. I think it all settles down to one line. Is this election about change or is it about stability? And in those days when I did this, they're about 50-50. But if you work that out, and if your candidate was a candidate of change in a change election, you won. If you was a candidate of stability, you didn't, and vice versa. One of the challenges today is actually pretty much every election is about change. There is a deep, profound dissatisfaction with the status quo in nearly all our countries. And what's viewed as a you know, vote against democracy and for populism you know, is often actually a vote against incumbency. Uh, incumbents are not popular because they're not rising uh, to the challenge of governance. And, and hence, to my final point, I mean, I think all of us, whichever region of the world we come from, are living at a moment, if I can put it like this, without a paradigm. Uh, we know what the past was. We don't know what the future looks like. We know we came out of what people call a neoliberal order uh, with a sort of market fundamentalist approach to making money and a limited view of what government's role should be. It's failed people everywhere, whether it's racial minorities in the United States or my own country, the UK, uh, whether it's great groups of marginal people elsewhere. So, you know, that need for a paradigm which brings us all back onto the same terrain of what we expect from government, both nationally and globally, is for me a prerequisite to democracy working again. Because democracy is between two teams on the same playing field. At the moment, they're playing on different playing fields. So one of the preconditions for democracy to function is a degree of self-discipline on the part of the players. And I have to congratulate my panel of six, every moderator's nightmare panel of six, um, for the self-discipline which has allowed us to get to this point, which means there will be questions from the audience. So by all means, begin to stack up in your minds a question for the last five to 10 minutes and uh, before we turn back to the panel. And I would invite also the panelists to to imagine intervening. But it seems to me that there is really an irrepressible need to come back to the dialogue that's implied between Lord Malafound's intervention and your statement, President Robles, which is essentially on the same page. We, we have this terrible uh, tradition of having both uh, last names, but uh, I'm Chavez. That's forgive okay. me, forgive me. That's okay. My but, mother's name is very good. But the same <laughs> issue is this issue of delivery, right? It's this issue of, which was look, key to your understanding. Look, I, I, I have a distinction that may not make a big difference from what uh, Lord Malloch Brown and uh, Samantha said. I, I, I treat you on a first, base, uh, first name basis, don't worry. <laughs> Look, if you accept democracy as the rules of the game, you have to accept that there's going to be contestation and accept the outcomes. Of course, there is a huge change. There is a big vote for change rather than continuity. And the reason is that the humanity, by and large, with few exceptions, wasted in a way for a large portion of the population the great moderation, the huge benefits of technological change in the sense that we saw a huge concentration of wealth. So this is the 90s, the 2000s, the 90s, early 2000s, the great moderation, low interest rates, good prices for commodities, technological advance, 
and then the tide lifted all boats, but lifted some boats like this. The United States is the big example, right? Uh, you know, the Midwest, the Rust Belt, and so on, and lifted some other boats like this, and humans said, naturally, whoops, that doesn't work for me. My hemisphere has taken a huge turn. I am the result of change. Eight months before the election, nobody knew me. Had no party, no money, no basis. But people in Costa Rica were fed up with the traditional parties, and we had 27 parties. Never in my country we had that. And when you say the, the democracy is under attack, no democracy is not under attack. The strength, the success of the attack depends on the strength of democracy. We had always fringe parties all over the world, and I don't want to mention countries specifically. But in some countries that were traditionally demo democratic, where those fringe parties would have never made it to the headlines, are in power today. So of course, because ideas and institutions in a democratic system need to compete and know that there's going to be constant const uh, contestation, is that an English word, mm -hmm. of who holds the power. So we say, oh, the freedom of the press is important. In Latin America, including my own country, some media were instruments of oligarchy control of democratic uh, processes. Some, a few. In one of the better functioning democracies in the world, thank God. However, came social media and challenged that. I would have not been president of my country had it not been for social media. I had the traditional media against me. Absolutely, still. Well, uh, yesterday a, a poll was released, and I don't mean to say this bragging. I am the most popular president in the history of my country at this stage of time, with the media against me. So what we need to realize, ladies and gentlemen, is that the rules of the game within democracy the bounds changed. And we cannot pretend that the old institutions and so on is going to maintain what we like. We have to fight for it. And there is only one way, the legitimacy of the democratic state. And that legitimacy depends on what the man and women of the street, who are not politicians in their enormous majority, by vocation, find whether they find that the state of democracy is delivering for them. And that's what we have failed to realize in many of the countries in my region, including my own. Sorry for being a bit too passionate, but uh, I think we're, those are distinctions that may not make a difference. In my, in my view, they do make a difference. Alexandra, if I, may, if I may turn to you, because, as it were, yours is the most extreme case that we could possibly be facing, and you spoke eloquently and forcefully about the stakes in the war being the preservation of Ukrainian democracy against this legal aggression. But democracy, as the other panelists are describing it, is a messy business. It's a contested business. It's a dirty business. So this thing that we are, you, your people, are laying down their lives to defend is a ambiguous, to say the least, uh, prize to win. Do you have a vision of how a Ukrainian democracy emerges? It presumably is not a vision of a return to the status quo ante before the war, is it? Or do you have a vision of how a democratic politics could be animated by, informed by, inspired, changed by the, by the war? We live in a very interconnected world, and only spread of freedom make our world safer. That's why I would like to tell not only about Ukraine, but about the problems of democracy in the whole world, and emphasize on two points. First, new technologies provide opportunity for rapid dis dissemination of information and new forms of association 
without any ties of national borders. But parallel, new technologies provide possibilities to segment horizontal networks, to manipulate public opinions by controlling flow of information and an analyzing personal data. And our future in this digital era can be very different. We can use example of China, which tried to build a digital dictatorship with a social rating system. And as a human rights defender, I sound an alarm because we must find a new ways how to protect freedom of expression, access to information, and defense of privacy in new digital era. And second, in my Nobel lecture last, years, last year, I mentioned that we must return the meaning to human rights. Human rights is a value. It's not just a word which we have to repeat because it's supposed to be heard from us. It means that human rights has to become a basis for political decision like economical benefits and security issues in internal policy and external policy as well. We are responsible for everything which is going on in our, in our planet. And country which systematically violates human rights obligations is a threat not only to their own citizens, is a threat to the region and to the whole world. Right, okay, so we in that sense come back to the liberal democratic peace thesis which anchored your observations also, Foreign Minister, in the sense that a society which is bound by the rule of law and bound by the principles of democracy is going to be a society that's more pacific, less dangerous. This issue of technology, however, rides across very many of the, very many of the observations people have been making. Um, um, Mark, you and I in the lounge earlier on this morning were talking about digital voting and technology mm. as part of the sort of armory that could be mobilized to, well, just make democracies run on time, right? Yeah. And to avoid the catastrophic, humiliating display of electoral systems in you know, some countries we could easily name. Um, do you, do, what do you see as the kind of costs and benefits of, of technology to the mechanics of democratic process, and why do they matter? Thanks, Adam. I mean, I, I get exasperated because actually electronic systems well run and well managed with the right kind of controls you know, are the best way of assuring that votes are counted properly. Now, those controls include civil society access at the point of voting and vote counts tabulated and, and declared locally before they're sent to a national count. But if there is proper civil society involvement at each step, or party involvement, party observer involvement, you can get a highly accurate, quick vote, which is rel almost immune to, to electoral uh, theft or, or, or distortion. The difficulty is that you know, people are so spooked by the idea of this sort of black box nature of vote counting that you know, we, we've failed to train our civil society partners in effectively monitoring these systems. So, you know, whether it was recent elections in, in Kenya and some other places I can name. Well, I mean, Brazil, which has... The, the Brazil system is the best in the world by anybody who, I think, you know, follows these things. It has a branch of the... the, the the, the, elect, the judicial system supervising it. It spends 30, I mean, 300 million, I think, every five years renewing its system. It, it, it's a model. And yet, of course, the whole purpose of this intervention last weekend, uh, the attack on the Congress, came from the allegation that the election had been stolen, that it was fraudulent. You know, similar claims uh, in Kenya and many other countries, often by our grantees. So, you know, I don't want to take sides on the point, but this lack of sophistication about electronic systems is very damaging. And of course, you know, they're very easy to discredit because it is 
a machine counting the votes. And so the US system is going backwards. You know, the reaction to these extraordinary scenes of delayed counting in the 2020 election is not more electronics and updated machines. It's in many places to pull it back to hand voting, where in a highly politicized context, where one side has tried to replace secretaries of state and other election officials, it potentially, and the midterm stopped a lot of this, but it was potentially you know, creating a whole new avenue for, for electoral threat at the hand counting level. So you know, I, I think it's time we kind of got a bit smarter about our election systems. President Levitz, I want you to come in and then and most of you. Yes. Um, I think uh, digital technology and democracy uh, is a new problem and uh, we should solve it uh, from the point of view of democracy. Uh, you s spoke about uh, a rather uh, technical issue of the voting system, electronic voting. I think this is possible to, to organize such a voting that uh, it is uh, uh, secure and, and so on. I think much more bigger challenge is uh, the digital technology and uh, the building of public opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, uh, the content of the public opinion, how it is organized and how it is um, manipulated and uh, whether we can somehow distinguish between uh, genuine public opinion and manipulated public opinion. Uh, one here in the room also spoke about oligarchs and, and uh, they have press and so on and so on. It is uh, by digital technology, by social networks, it is uh, much more easier to manipulate the public opinion. And then I think this is an absolutely new situation and we should uh, think about how to, how to deal with that. Uh, also, the uh, role of the intermediaries uh, like uh, Facebook, uh, you can uh, write on Facebook and there are maybe spread in for 10 people or for 10,000 people, mm. but it is up to Facebook uh, to decide on that and how they are deciding. Also, th this is not, uh, not uh, transparent. And I think uh, all the problems uh, are new problems and we should, uh, should um, also by on theoretical and in practical way to, to try to solve. This is a special issue which, would, which uh, it deserves a special discussion. But I only to uh, say that this is a new, new challenge to democracy. It is also uh, uh, at the beginning of uh, democracy. There was also uh, Napoleon has, organ uh, he has um, organized uh, uh, referendums on his laws. <coughs> He remained an authoritarian um, uh, ruler, but 95% 90, of uh, the population uh, voted for him. For him. Now, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the age of digital technologies, it is also possible, and I think we should uh, organize some, some kind of uh, safeguards. But uh, this is a special discussion. So the true nightmare that's revealed both in the US and the Brazilian case is it becomes political all the mm. way down, so yeah. that you cannot make that neat division between what you might think is the mechanical process of simply deciding yes, no, which way does this, which mm. box does this vote go in, and the inflamed global mm. discussion about what's happening in American democracy or Brazilian democracy. And that, I mean, we on this, on, in our hemisphere have experienced it's truly shaking when it happens to you. I mean, when mm. you do not know whether the patently mathematically correct outcome of a counting process, we're not talking about calculus here, we're simply talking about adding numbers up, will not yield the outcome that it clearly should. And, 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 and even that can be shaken. And this is where the mechanics do become quite important, important. because you need those to be as watertight, as transparent as possible. But Administrator Powers, you wanted to come in. Well, I wanted to come in to uh, tie the three big themes that we've discussed so far together. Ukraine, yeah. where everything hits home and everything matters. Technology, which you've introduced and people have spoken to and so at the center of where democracy is going. And then this question of delivering. And I wanna bring it back to Ukraine. Um, one of the things that we, when we think about Ukraine, of course we think first of the incredible courage of the people and everything that they are going through right now. 
Um, we think of the volunteers and the grassroots mobilization. We think of the grotesqueness and the brutality of Putin and his forces. We don't really think about technology. But Ukraine is one of the globe's great trailblazers right now in terms of technology. And President Zelensky came along uh, in around 2019 and he said he wanted to put the state in a smartphone. And, and as Alexandra can attest, and she could even show us on her, on her smartphone, uh, USA partnered with the Ukrainian government in 2019 and helped them build something called DIA, which is an app that now has 120 services for citizens on it. Mm -hmm. It includes everything from get your birth certificate, your death certificate, pay your taxes. Uh, it has been pivoted uh, in the conflict uh, to be able to get benefits to displaced persons. It's all, you know, from the beginning was, was tending to, to pensioners. You can start a business uh, through DIA. And you know, it does two things. It delivers, it helps citizens feel connected. 18 million of the 30, 30 million adults in Ukraine have this app DIA and use it. Uh, it, it actually, because of geo uh, uh, spatial recognition, it can tell you where a displaced person has moved to. Mm -hmm. It can report to a family property damage, even if they're living in Germany, about what has happened. But the second thing it does is it allows citizens to hold their government accountable mm -hmm. because it renders much more transparent processes that for too long were susceptible uh, to corruption. And you know, to see now, it, it, there's going to be a lot of reconstruction in Ukraine. Many of the people who are gathered here in Davos, I hope, are going to be part of that. The reconstruction needs to happen now, not await the ultimate disposition now. Every repair matters now. Well, with DIA, you can actually, at every construction site in Ukraine, there's a, a permitting process. You know, Somebody has to figure out who's, who's actually doing the, the, the rebuilding. And there's a QR code at the construction site. You hold your phone up. You get the QR code. It tells you who has the permit. You can actually access the contracts that went into to the rebuilding. So we have to remember in Ukraine there are two wars. There's the war that is on the front page of every newspaper, and there's this war, the war that Alexandra and her, her peers are a part of, which is strengthening democracy, fighting corruption, and making this an exemplar for how we harness technology for good, again, not and, and withstand the, the worst misappropriation of it, but recognize how connected it can be to delivering for citizens. Well, that's, a, that's a fascinating example. and. Uh, uh, arguably another incredibly dramatic exercise of, of an even larger scale is obviously India's experimentation with various forms of digital citizenship, which at a rough approximation reach 100 times as many people. If they can essentially provide basic digital services and benefits to 1.4 billion people. Um, that obviously has a huge potential to be exploited also for populist purposes. You can target the bread emblem of bread and circuses at the phone that will also deliver cheap cricket broadcasts, right? So you can secure a kind of populist consent through these mechanisms, but they certainly have the effect of tying citizens to the state, making the state visible in the medium that's most available. We're going to go to questions in just a second, but I think it would be remiss, given the agenda of the forum over so many years now, and I don't have a particular person in mind, so I'm hoping somebody will pick this up and run with it for me. That, that, we, that, we, um, that we also address the issue of sustainability and the enormous challenge, I think, for democracies. On the one hand, of, as it were, basic delivery, of survival of intense existential crisis, of the avoidance of decay. But there is also this challenge without which democracies will fail collectively to address the future in the most ambitious sense. In other words, fit for 50. Carbon targets that go to 2030 these kind of dimensions. And it seems to me that that, too, is something that we, that we have to have answers for as Democrats. And there's an obvious suggestion that authoritarians, perhaps, because they're more long-lived, they have longer time horizons, they aren't facing 18-month electoral cycles, have an advantage here. Does anyone on the panel, maybe I'll throw it out this way, have a feeling, yes, sir, thank you very much. Thank you. I, I, Costa Ricans, not me, Costa Ricans in general can talk a little bit about sustainability. We went. We were the first country in the world to re not only stop but reverse uh, tropical deforestation. We went from about 24% of tropical uh, of forest coverage to more than 55%. Yeah. We have 100% of uh, electricity generated through 
basically 100% through renewable um, sources. So, and we did it in democracy. And you did it, can I just ask, is it is it because it's cheaper and better or because it's a good business opportunity and that green that's, modernization and ecotourism is the that's promise? That's what or? I was going to say. Ah. When it became, when a tree was worth more with what we call the lazy little birds, uh, lazy little birds, uh, how do you call them in, in English? Uh, los ositos perezosos? It's lots. Yeah. That is love is worth more much it's love. It's love. But, uh, when people take selfies next to yeah. it, right? <laughs> so people don't want to cut the tree. Yeah. We made it a good business, which is a requirement for sustainability. <coughs> you can and should swim against the right currents, but you can never do it forever. Democracy starts low, as we said. They don't cause revolutions because of the political cycle, time horizon. But we managed to create a national consciousness. Costa Rica is the only country in the world, world where all forms of hunting and trapping of wild animals and keeping them at home are illegal, you are prosecuted, and you go to jail if you keep one of our gorgeous scarlet macaws mm -hmm. at home. My grandmother had many. Today it's impossible. So that, that's what I wanted to say, that yeah. there is no contradiction between the rule of law, democracy, and managing intelligently the environment. Mm. Uh, I think uh, that's a lesson that uh, is worthwhile taking a look at, because it became profitable. And Adam, can I just add one sentence? It's not actually this idea that autocrats do better because they think more long term. The evidence really isn't there. Autocrats look over their shoulder. They think short term. There's no suggestion that, that China, for example, really has a longer term development strategy for dealing with the green transition than the US, you know, a weak democratic president, weak in terms of his congressional majority, has put through the IRA. Uh, you know, China, it, it doesn't stand up much better. So I, I think, you know, the fact is it's all about leadership, Democrat or authoritarian. It's all about persuading your, those who are support you, your, your constituencies, your stakeholders, that this vision matters now and for the future. It's going to deliver cake today and tomorrow, and it, that's the challenge of politics everywhere. Nor should we be spooked by bad theories about how democracies work and don't work, yeah. following on from there. Yeah. I've got one question at the back there. I'm going to take a couple. So uh, the gent in the glasses, he had his hands up first, and then the lady with the glasses there. So I'll couple those two, and then, wow, we are, we are busy. Okay, so. Hello. Thank you. Um, my name is Vince Chedrick. I'm a journalist uh, with DevEx. I've got a question for Administrator uh, Power. Um, in Brussels, where I work, um, people increasingly, uh, we've felt the impact in the last few years of what happens when people feel democracy at home isn't, isn't working for them. I'm thinking about Brexit and perhaps other, other examples. I wanted to raise with you the 2019 book, um, Winners Take All, the elite charade of changing the world, which I know you read and were influenced by. And you told the author that there needed to be a reflection about what that book meant for the international aid industry. And I'm wondering now, four years later, what that reflection is. Thank you. Lady here, also with the glasses. Maybe a mic in there. Quick, quick. Keep your hands up so I know where I'm going. Hi, good afternoon. Maria Teresa with Voto Latino. We are the largest voter registration outfit in the country in the United States, having registered close to 1.4 million individuals and touching roughly 11 million people a month. One of the questions I have is specifically, when are we going to start talking about cyber insecurity and disinformation as really a tactic for cy cyber war. And I think, Alexandra, you mentioned it most, and then uh, Mr. Levitz used it as well. When we first started, our job was simply to register voters. But at the rise of <coughs> disinformation, I would say, is one of the things that were resulting in real online tactics actually translating into on the ground. In Ukraine, we saw Putin's force in a real way undermining democracy. January 6th, we saw the right wing and other elements of foreign interference that basically went from cyber insecurity to the big lie to filling and really trying to destabilize democracy. So what I ask 
one of the things that Ukraine has done so successfully is the use of disinformation and battling it among your people to inoculate them from bad information, but also how can we proceed to start enabling it what it is, which is we are at cyber war within, but also external. Thank Thanks you. so much. Because it's easy, there's a gentleman next to you. I'm going to go with the same mic. And then along to the gentleman. Well, my name is Humberto Rumos. I'm a global shaper from Caracas, Venezuela. Um, as the president of Latvia said, uh, we are from the new challenges, new digital challenges that need to be addressed globally. And continuing to this question, um, the digital environment doesn't belong to a country or to a region, but uh, to the whole world. And for example, in Venezuela in 2022, there were massive campaigns of disinformation about the situation in Ukraine, about the invasion of Russia. And if you can uh, attack those problems in Europe, there will always be other attacks in other regions, like Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, for example. So my question is for the chief of state um, who are in the, in the, in the head of this, their government, about how you think about what you can do as a chief of state to address these challenges. And if you have, uh, 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 it would be great to know more about those thoughts. I hate to do this, but we've got four minutes on the clock. And those are three great questions. And we've got six panelists. So I am going to have to wrap. I'm so sorry. Maybe we can, maybe we can have some uh, responses to these, these excellent questions. We have the issue of oligarchy winner takes all. We have the issue of misinformation. We have the issue to the heads of state in particular of how to, how to address these sort of cross-contamination from struggle to another. Where do we start? Alexandra, would you like to? I will start with a concrete example. I'm a human rights defender and work directly with people who went throughout the hell. I worked with people who survived from Russian captivity and they told me horrible stories how they were beaten raped, how their fingers were cut, how they were smashed into wooden boxes, how they were tortured with electricity. One woman told me how her eye were dug out with a spoon. So this story is a story of a young woman from Donetsk. She was arrested because she has pro-Ukrainian views in her country, in, in her native town, which is under Russian occupation. She was tortured very severely, regardless of the fact that she, she was pregnant. She begged not to beat her because she is waiting for a child, but she got response, you have a pre-Ukrainian sympathy, so your child have no right to be born. And then she was told, OK, we will release her, you if you will tell Russian journalists that you are a sniper. For sure, she agreed. And this so-called Russian journalist arrived and started to make this video with her. And one details which shocked me very much that when these journalists understood that she is a pregnant, they asked her to sit in a pose to hide your pregnancy because it's ruined the whole plot of this, of this story. And I don't have a concrete answer to your question, how to deal with disinformation, but I totally believe that we have to provide justice. And the, these people who work at the part of military machine to insignificant hatred has to be responsible. I think we stop there. Thank you very much. I think this was an amazing panel. And really, <laughs>